back on track uh, for the remainder of the week. Uh, so sorry that we have to stay hungry a little while longer. It's my <laughs> fault. I take the full blame for that. Um, I also want to apologize to Manjo. I should shut up already, but I asked him to give four talks, uh, which is a kind of weird reward for doing good work. <laughs> so sorry. I won't do that to you ever again. Um, yeah, so I'll, let, I'll give the floor to Manjo. Of number Miguel, thank, thank you so much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here this term, uh, and in particular for this workshop. I'm very grateful to the organizers uh, for putting uh, this wonderful semester together and this workshop and uh, inviting me uh, to give too many talks. Um, okay, so there, there are two points that I sort of want to make uh, in these talks. Maybe I'll try to get out of the last one. I think it is too many, actually. Well, let's see. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll see. Uh, well, that, uh, but the two points I want to make in these talks is, uh, at first, in describing uh, the distribution of arithmetic objects, which is sort of the goal of this workshop in this semester, uh, it's often helpful to know how to explicitly write down these objects, uh, and how, in, in particular, how to explicitly parameterize uh, arithmetic objects. And so that's sort of the theme for, for the lecture today, uh, some background today and then tomorrow. Uh, and what I want to argue is that one good way to parameterize algebraic objects is through orbits of, of representations of algebraic groups. Uh, so that's going to be uh, an example of a kind of parameterization that is useful in studying uh, distributions of arithmetic objects. And I want to give about, well, I'll probably give about 100 such examples. <laughs> in these lectures, it's not, it's not a very well understood theory. Uh, there are lots of examples now, uh, but it's more of an art uh, on how to produce such parameterizations of algebraic objects. And so that's kind of what I want to build up to in these first two lectures. And then the second point I want to make is that once one has such a, uh, such a parameterization of algebraic objects, uh, then to try to understand the distribution, the statistics of these objects, uh, one has to develop methods of counting uh, these orbits, say, if we're parameterizing by orbits of group representations, we need a way of, of counting, uh, counting these orbits. And so various ways uh, can be developed to do that. Uh, one is geometry of numbers. That's what I'll uh, mainly be talking about. But there are other methods uh, as well. For example, zeta function methods, uh, as Frank will talk about, uh, Frank Thorne will talk about uh, at the end of the week. Uh, OK, so, so those are sort of the two main themes of these lectures. So let me talk about one such parameterization. Uh, that goes back. Uh, so this is sort of background. Uh, I apologize if you've seen these things before, but this is sort of where, uh, where I personally got started. But this is from the Disquisiciones uh, of Gauss, uh, an example of an algebraic group representation uh, that he studied in his Disquisiciones is the binary quadratic form. So binary quadratic form is a lattice. Uh, the set of all binary quadratic forms over the integers form a lattice uh, in a two-dimensional representation of SL2. OK, so, so binary quadratic form for our purposes will be anything of the form ax squared plus bxy plus y squared, where a, b, and c are integers. And so Gauss studied these set of integral binary quadratic forms. Actually, Gauss always assumed b is even, but that, uh, we'll ignore that for, for now. And if you look at binary quadratic forms, uh, there's a natural action of SL2z on the set of integral binary quadratic forms by linear substitution of variable. You can replace x by a linear combination of x and y and y by a linear combination of x and y. And that, uh, that sends an integral binary quadratic form to an integral binary quadratic form if your matrix of substitution uh, was integral. And if it has determinant 1, so if you're in SL2z and you're doing a linear change of variable that has determinant 1 over the integers, then it'll send integral binary quadratic forms to integral binary quadratic forms. And moreover, something will be preserved, namely this expression that we all know, b squared minus 4ac. So b squared minus 4ac is something that remains unchanged under the action of SL2z on integral binary quadratic forms. And in fact, it's the unique, it's the unique invariant for this action in the sense that if you look at the ring of polynomial invariants, so the, all polynomials in a, b, and c that stay the same when you do uh, SL2z changes a variable, then any such polynomial that remains invariant will be a polynomial in b squared minus 4ac. Okay, so in that sense, it's the unique polynomial invariant. Okay, it, generates, it generates the ring of invariance for this action. OK, so this is a, this is a natural representation of the group SL2z on a, on a lattice. 
namely this three-dimensional space of binary quadratic forms. Okay. And so we can ask, what do the orbits parametrize? Okay, what are the uh, what do the orbits of this action mean? So if you look at, so the discriminant is preserved. So if you look at all binary quadratic forms that have a fixed discriminant, uh, it's a theorem of Minkowski that says that the number of such orbits is finite. And so we can ask how many such orbits are there, for example. Uh, so what Gauss was, uh, what Gauss proved about these orbits uh, was a certain group structure. So what he said is that if you take the set of SL2Z equivalence classes of primitive integral binary quadratic forms of a given discriminant, so there are only finally, uh, finally many such things. So if you look at a number that's 0, 1 mod 4, call that d, and you look at all binary quadratic forms that have that discriminant, that value of b squared minus 4ac, up to this SL2z equivalence, then that set of primitive integral binary quadratic forms has a group structure. And it's what's nowadays called the narrow class group of the unique quadratic order that has that discriminant d. So this is called Gauss composition. So what Gauss is saying is that the, the set of orbits that have a given discriminant, uh, set of integral binary quadratic forms that have a given discriminant up to SL2z equivalence, they naturally form the structure of a group, uh, which is now days called the narrow class group. So this was quite a discovery because the notion of group hadn't existed yet. So in modern language, this group that's in theorem one, it's called the narrow class group of the unique quadratic order that has that discriminant, D. So unique order in a quadratic field. That's the discriminant of order is D. If you look at the narrow class group of that, that's exactly the group that's being parameterized by the orbits uh, of this group action. So this is the first example, sort of, of a parameterization of an arithmetic object, namely the narrow class group elements of quadratic orders, by the, the integer orbits of a certain uh, group action of an algebraic group, namely SL2. And so I'd like to say this is still one of the best ways for uh, enumerating class groups of class group elements of quadratic fields. And so this is something that struck me uh, when I was a graduate student, is that you can parameterize arith this arithmetic object, namely class group elements, by, uh, by the integer orbits of a, of a group representation. But I was struck by the fact that this is something that's been used so much, and yet it only applies to, for example, to quadratic fields, to orders in quadratic fields. So the question was, do there exist, do there exist other, I was looking for, in particular, for group structures, but one can ask even more generally, uh, are there other spaces of forms besides binary quadratic forms or other representations of algebraic groups uh, that might have similar structures uh, to what Gauss discovered for binary quadratic forms? So for example, could one use other spaces of forms to shed light on higher degree number fields, okay, instead of quadratic number fields. So, so it's still a very vague question. I want to try to make it a little more precise. So I want to phrase this as an orbit problem. Okay. So Gauss composition can be stated in modern language as a solution to an orbit problem. So by an orbit problem, I just mean you have a group, you have a representation, what do the orbits mean? Okay, what do they parameterize? And the way you can think of Gauss composition is as follows. You can think of, so sim2z2 is just a notation for binary quadratic forms. It's the symmetric square of the standard representation of SL2. If you look at the space of binary quadratic forms, modulo the action of SL2z, then what Gauss is saying is that these orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with pairs s comma i, where s is an order in a quadratic field and i is an ideal class an error ideal class in that quadratic field, in that quadratic ring, quadratic order. Okay. Right, so that's a, that's a way of thinking about Gauss composition. And what, what his composition law was, was just multiplying ideal classes on the right. right. And that leads to a group structure on the objects on the left, namely the orbits for the action uh, of SL2z on binary quadratic forms. Okay, okay so, so Gauss composition is really a solution to an orbit problem for a sp particular uh, integer, uh, algebraic group over the integers acting on a lattice in a representation of that group. So uh, in general, we could consider any algebraic group G and any rational, so defined over the rational numbers or over the integers, and any rational uh, representation V uh, of that algebraic group. Uh, and we want both of these to have so be defined over the integers so that we can talk about the lattice of integer points in V 
being acted on by sort of the, uh, by the integer elements of G. And we can ask the same question that Gauss solved for binary quadratic forms in SL2. We can ask for what pairs G comma V, where G is an algebraic group and V is a vector space, okay, both defined over Z. Uh, what, do, what does the, the action, what are the orbits of the action of G of Z on V of Z mean? in terms of, say, rings or modules. Uh, what algebraic objects are parameterized by the integer orbits of, of a general group representation? So for example, when V was the space of binary quadratic forms and G was SL2Z, then what we were parameterizing was ideal classes in quadratic orders. Okay, okay so that's the Gauss composition gives one solution to a particular case of V and G. Okay, well, it's still a pretty vague question. <laughs> and the main question that arises first is, well, where do you look for more such representations? Uh, okay, so first of all, what's special about the space of binary quadratic forms that allowed one to get a parameterization of orders and number fields and class group elements? Okay, what was special about that representation? OK, well, one key observation that you can make uh, about binary quadratic forms is that if you look at the action of GL2, say GL2C, over binary quadratic forms over C, then that action has essentially just one orbit. It has one Zariski open orbit. So if you look at the action of GL2 on the C on the space of binary quadratic forms over C, okay, then that has just one Zariski open orbit, namely those binary quadratic forms that uh, have non-zero discriminant. Right? The way you can sort of see that is a binary quadratic form cuts out two points in P1, and any two points in P1 are, are equivalent to any other two points in P1 by a linear fractional transformation. And that exactly is the transformation in GL2 that will take the binary quadratic form that has those two roots to the binary quadratic form that has the other two roots. Okay, so there's essentially just one orbit, one Zariski open orbit uh, for this action. So that's something special uh, about the, the representation of binary quadratic forms. And in general, so Henri already mentioned this this morning, so in general a representation like that, a pair G comma V, okay, so a G algebraic group V representation, such that there's just one Zariski open orbit uh, over the complex numbers. That's called a prehomogeneous vector space. So that representation is called a prehomogeneous vector space if there's just one Zariski open orbit uh, for the action. So that's, uh, that's a, binary quadratic forms are, is one example of a prehomogeneous vector space, and we can ask, are there other such representations? That may be a first place to look for other parameterization spaces, uh, such as Gauss's. Uh, so are there other such representations? And the answer is yes. And Sato and Kimura gave, in 1977, they gave a classification of all prehomogeneous vector spaces, because there are certain applications in representation theory of such spaces. Uh, we're looking for applications in arithmetic, but luckily they came up in another subject beforehand. And so what, the, what Sato and Kimura proved is that there are 36 of them. <laughs> There's 36 such representations. Uh, this is under certain conditions. So they're assuming certain niceness conditions, namely that the representations are irreducible, that G is a reductive group, and there's another technical assumption that, uh, another niceness assumption on the representation. So if you assume certain niceness uh, assumptions on what G and V satisfy, for example, that they're irreducible uh, and so on, then you find that there are only 36 such representations in the world. Uh, that's kind of a lie because some of these are infinite families. <laughs> okay, so that's, <laughs> okay, so that's, that's something good. Uh, okay, so we can look at these representations. This is a good place to start. Uh, binary quadratic forms is one of the first ones that appears on this list. <laughs> And then you have all these other uh, representations that go on from there. And you can ask, uh, what do the orbits over the integers look like? Okay, just like for binary quadratic forms, the orbits over the integers are really interesting. They parameterize ideal classes in quadratic fields, in quadratic orders, even though over the complex numbers, it's, this is a completely boring representation. It only has one orbit. <laughs> right, but over the integers, suddenly all this rich arithmetic comes out. And the same question can be asked for other representations that for people who just study over the complex numbers, these are totally boring representations because they only have one orbit. Uh, but if you look over the integers, then there's a possibility that a rich arithmetic structure will emerge. So before looking over the integers, maybe you want to look over a field other than the complex numbers. Okay. And if you look over fields 
uh, other than the complex numbers, for example, over the rational numbers, then this was, a, this was studied by uh, Wright and, and Yuki in 1990. And they showed that orbits of several of these primogenous vector spaces over, say, the rational numbers, those orbits uh, corresponded to uh, field extensions uh, of the base field. So over Q, the orbits corresponded to field extensions of Q of a given degree, the degree being 2, 3, 4, or 5, or 1 sometimes. Uh, yeah? No, they don't. Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a good point. So they, they found models over Q, such that if you looked at the, uh, if you looked at the orbits over, uh, over Q with that model, then this is what they corresponded to. That's a very good question. So actually, these are, they're just 36 over them over the complex numbers, but now if you start looking at models over Q and over Z, there are actually lots and lots of forms. And sometimes those different forms parameterize different things arithmetically. And that's actually very useful. Uh, very good question. OK, so, so what Wright and Yuki's results already shows is that there is some arithmetic going on in these primogenous vector spaces. Because if you look over Q, you're getting field extensions. So already, there is, uh, there is some arithmetic going on. And so, so when I saw this, I thought, OK, well, the goal should be we should understand not just over the rationals. We should understand integer orbits. If we look at an integral model of one of these representations, and we want to understand vz mod gz for primogenous vector spaces g comma v. Okay. Will they have? So a lot of rich arithmetic structures should come out. Just, so for example, one way you could have guessed that binary quadratic forms would be interesting integrally is that if you look first over the rational numbers, binary quadratic forms over the rational numbers parameterize quadratic fields. Namely, you look at the two roots and see what field they're defined over. Right? So you already see quadratic fields uh, in binary quadratic forms just by looking over the rational numbers. And then when you go to the integers, you start seeing ideal classes coming out. So the richer arithmetic information. So same thing. We can ask for other primogenous vector spaces. Do the integral orbits correspond to uh, even richer arithmetic objects than just number fields? So there's one other piece of data beyond Gauss composition, beyond binary quadratic forms, namely binary cubic forms. So this piece of data was already there before I even thought about this question. So what about binary cubic forms? Okay. We already, so we know binary quadratic forms par, uh, parameterize ideal classes uh, in orders in quadratic fields. What happens with binary cubic forms? So, so I learned about what binary cubic forms parameterize over the integers uh, uh, from a paper of Wiechek, Gan, and Gross, and Savin. And what they showed is a, a refinement, ref, refinement of a classical result of Delaunay and Fedeev, uh, which states the following. It says that if you look at the GL2z orbits uh, on integral binary cubic forms, the GL2 and the SL2z don't matter too much. Uh, there's only uh, one is index 2 and the other, so it's not a big deal. So they look at the GL2z orbits on integral binary cubic forms. They're in canonical bijection with cubic rings. So uh, what is a cubic ring? A cubic ring just means uh, Uh, a rank 3 free Z module that has a ring structure. It's like a Z3 with a ring structure. So your prototypical, prototypical cubic ring is an order in a cubic field. So, so what this result is saying is that if you take the GL2Z orbits on integral binary cubic forms, okay, they're in canonical bijection uh, with orders in cubic fields, basically. Okay. So it's kind of similar to the binary quadratic case, except the ideal class disappeared. <laughs> Right, so in the, in the binary quadratic case, you had a quadratic ring plus an ideal class. Uh, here, you lose the ideal class, but you do parameterize cubic rings, uh, which is a very non-trivial object uh, compared to quadratic rings, for example, which are very easy to parameterize. Quadratic rings are basically determined by their discriminant. Okay, an order in a quadratic field will be determined by what its discriminant is. An order in a cubic field, there can be many orders that have the same discriminant. So you need finer information to, to parameterize uh, orders in cubic fields. And that finer information is integral binary cubic forms. Those completely, uh, the orbits of binary cubic forms completely parameterize cubic rings. And here's how it works. It's very, it's very pretty. You can make it very explicit. Uh, if you have a binary cubic form, ax cubed plus bx squared y plus cxy squared plus dy cubed, where a, b, c, d are integers, then here's how you can make a cubic ring. Okay, you make, so you say the basis of your cubic ring is going to be 1, omega, and theta. So how do you specify the ring structure 
uh, on a space on a on a lattice parameter uh, having basis one omega and theta, you basically have to specify what omega squared is, what theta squared is, and what omega times theta is, because we know what one times anything is. Okay. So, so using A, B, C, D, we want to specify a ring structure, and so we just have to define what omega theta is, define it to be minus A, D, what omega squared is, take that thing, take what theta squared is. And so using the coefficients of the binary cubic form, uh, we made a cubic ring, so these are formulas of Delaunay and Fedeev. And you check that this actually defines a ring structure. You check associativity, and it's clearly commutative, and so on. Uh, but it's, it's associative. That's the miracle. And so that gives, uh, that gives a cubic ring. And conversely, if you have a cubic ring, then you can write the multiplication table in this form, always, you show. And then that gives you a binary cubic form, A, B, C, D. And if you do a GL2Z change of basis uh, on, the, on the cubic ring, then what you find is that the binary cubic form also changes by that action of that same element of GL2Z. So, that, so if you change the basis omega theta to some GL2Z change of basis of omega and theta, then that'll act then that same way on the binary cubic form. So that's why you get a bijection, a natural bijection between GL2Z orbits on binary cubic forms and orders in cubic fields, basically cubic rings. Uh, if this is too explicit for you, <laughs> Uh, a basis-free way to get to a binary cubic form uh, from a cubic ring, well, if you're given a cubic ring R, uh, if you look at what's called the index form, 1 wedge x wedge x squared, that's a cubic, that's a cubic form uh, that takes values in wedge 3 of R, which is one-dimensional, so it's basically Z, so it's basically a binary cubic form on R mod Z. So R mod Z is two-dimensional, it's a cubic form, so it's, that gives you a basis-free way of constructing a binary cubic form. Okay, so this is, a, this, is a, this is a solution to another orbit problem. It says that binary cubic forms uh, parameterize orders in cubic fields. And as I'll talk about later, this indeed is the, is the parameterization behind all the Davenport Hilbron uh, theorems and all the later works uh, in that direction. So, parameterizing algebraic objects in terms of uh, orbits of group representations, that's, that's already was behind uh, this work of Davenport and Hilbron. Okay, so, so our question is, well, how do we come up with more of these? We have binary quadratic forms, we have binary cubic forms. Okay, why not go to binary quartic forms next? Well, binary quartic forms are not pre homogeneous because if you take four points in P1, they're not equivalent to any other four points in P1. So there's not just, uh, so binary quartic forms are not pre homogeneous So that's not the next place to go. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the list, you can look at the list of all pre homogeneous vector spaces on Satu and Kimura's list, and you find, well, of course, binary quartic forms are not there. Many other things are there. And how does one go into one of them and start analyzing the integer orbits? It's something, well, it's kind of daunting because some of these spaces are 4D, 50 dimensional. They're very big. And so to, tr to try and just uh, analyze the integer orbits in one of these representations uh, is a very daunting thing. Even if you look at the original treatment by Gauss of binary quadratic forms, uh, that already takes like 20 pages of computations to prove that there's this group structure and uh, this correspondence. So, so the way I th thought to start was, was to look at Gauss composition again and try to come up with a way that might incorporate other spaces uh, into Gauss's original Gauss composition and then see how that could maybe generalize. So, so here was the idea. What would happen if we Took, put numbers on the corners of a cube. So it's a two by two by two matrix. So when one has a two by two by two matrix, then one can slice. Okay, so this is a two by two by two matrix. Let's consider A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H to be integers. And what would happen if you slice the cube uh, into pairs of two by two matrices? So if you have a two by two by two matrix, you can slice the cube on any of the three planes of symmetry to get two two by two matrices. Right? So, for example, if you cut off the front face from the back face, you get ABCD and then EFGH. Right? Or if you take the left face and the right face, you get these two matrices. Or if you take the top face and the bottom face, you get these two matrices. Okay, so, anytime you have a two by two by two 
matrix, a three-dimensional matrix, two by two by two, you can, uh, you can slice it into two two by two matrices in essentially three different ways. Okay, so what do you do when you have two two by two matrices? There's a natural thing to do when, if you're presented with a pair of two by two matrices, which is you can take the family of matrices, the linear span, the linear family of matrices that go through M1 and N1, say, and take the determinant function, okay, because you can take a determinant of a two by two matrix. So, in other words, you can, you can take the determinant of M1x plus N1y, where x and y are indeterminates. And since the determinant is degree two on two by two matrices, this is a binary quadratic form. Right. I put minuses there, but they're not so important. Uh, and the same way, if you have another pair of two by two matrices, we have three pairs of two by two matrices. And on each one, you can take x times the first plus y times the second and take the determinant. And that'll give you a binary quadratic form. And so what that means is that any time you have a two by two by two matrix, uh, it spits out three binary quadratic forms. So the situation is similar, and there'll be an explicit uh, correspondence with elliptic curves that I'll talk about later in the week. But just like when you have a plane elliptic curve, and you, uh, you take uh, a line uh, in the projective plane, it'll intersect the cubic curve in three points. And one way of defining the elliptic curve law on elliptic curves is to say the sum of those three points is zero. And so this is something analogous. Here we have a two by two cube, and it spits out three binary quadratic forms. Uh, so a natural way to try to define a group law in binary quadratic forms is to say, let's say the sum of those three things is zero. Is zero. So one checks that if you look at the discriminant of each one of these three binary quadratic forms, you can just write out the, the discriminants are the same of all three of these binary quadratic forms. And so if you declare, if you take sort of the free abelian group generated by all binary quadratic forms of a given discriminant, modulo all such relations that come from cubes. <laughs> that, so if you say that for every two by two by two cube, uh, the sum of the three binary quadratic forms that it spits out is zero. That, that's, uh, that defines, uh, that punchline is that that agrees with Gauss composition. So for every two by two by two cube, you get three binary quadratic forms. And the sum of them is zero. Uh, under Gauss's uh, group law. So this gives a, at least a very short way of describing uh, what binary, uh, what uh, Gauss composition is in terms of two by two by two matrices. And the process that went into, uh, went into to making this definition is sort of an unfolding process. We took binary quadratic forms and we unfolded them into these sort of two, 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 two trilinear forms, right? So we took we took quadratic forms and made them multilinear. That's what that's sort of what's going on here, and that's a theme that will uh, will occur throughout these lectures. Uh, you can take complicated objects and you can that look like they have high degree and make them multilinear instead by this kind of unfolding process. And then a lot of the things that seem complicated for the for the high degree forms become simpler uh, when you think of them as multilinear forms. Okay, so this is a way to think of, of, of Gauss composition. Notice that the, the action of GL2Z is automatically incorporated in this. So you can think of the spaces of two by two by two matrices as Z2 tensor Z2 tensor Z2, which is a representation of SL2Z cross SL2Z cross SL2Z, right? And so SL2Z, the first SL2Z acts by row operations and the second SL2Z acts by column operations and the third SL2Z acts in the other directional operations. Right? And, that's, uh, and if you look at these formulas for how you define the binary quadratic forms, if you use the first SL2Z, it's going to change basis on this quadratic form, but keep these two the same. And so if the sum of those three is zero, and the sum of those three is zero even after you do an SL2Z change of variable, what that means is that a binary quadratic form and its SL2Z equivalent are equal in the group because you're mining out by both those relations. So the SL2Z action is sort of automatic in this. You don't have to explicitly say it. Uh, it comes automatically. Okay. okay, so how does this contain? So this is a, a description of gas composition. 
And so what I want to point out now is that not only does this give a description of Gauss composition, but it in fact gives uh, composition laws on other pre homogeneous vector spaces, not just binary quadratic forms. For example, the space of cubes themselves, if you look at the space of all 2 by 2 by 2 matrices, that's a pre homogeneous vector space under the action of SL2Z cross SL2Z cross SL2Z. So Z2 tensor Z2 tensor Z2, that's space of 2 by 2 by 2 cubes. If you mod out by the action of SL2Z cubed, in other words, the action of row operations, column operations, and the other directional operations, right, then those orbits, what that discussion is saying is that those orbits are in one to one correspondence with a quadratic order, S, and three ideal classes, namely the ideal classes corresponding to those three binary quadratic forms that the cube spits up. Okay. So another way of thinking of, uh, of this operation I said there is as a solution to an orbit problem, namely the cubes, space of cubes, modulo SL2Z cubed is in one-to-one -one correspondence with with the, the, this, is, this is the object being parameterized, quadratic order together with three ideal classes that sum to zero in the class group. And so that gives, just like, Gauss compos just like the binary quadratic form discussion gives a composition law in binary quadratic forms, this discussion gives, okay, so the way to think of Gauss composition is that you can multiply ideal classes, right? So, this corresponds to a binary quadratic form of a given discriminant. This is a binary quadratic form of the same discriminant. You can compose them by just multiplying the ideal classes. That's what Gauss composition means uh, in terms of ideal classes. Gauss described it in terms of the forms. But in the same way, we have now a composition of cubes. Right? Because if you, have a, if you have a 2 by 2 by 2 cube, that corresponds to three ideal classes that sum to zero. And if you have another cube, that you have three more ideal classes that sum to zero. And you can multiply them by just multiplying those three ideal classes. Uh, that correspond to each other. Right. And one can actually describe this purely in terms of the cubes. You have a 2 by 2 by 2 cube and another 2 by 2 by 2 cube of the same discriminant. Then you can give an algebraic formula that produce a cube here. But uh, in terms of ideal classes, in terms of what those orbits parameterize, this makes it uh, very clear what the composition should mean. It corresponds to multiplication of the respective ideal classes. Okay, so, so what we're saying is that not only uh, do, do binary quadratic forms have composition, but uh, two by two by two cubes also have composition. And this has an interesting consequence in that, so the number of orbits of a given discriminant for binary quadratic forms is the narrow class number right, of, of the quadratic order. In this case, it's the narrow class number squared, right? because I1 and I2 can be anything, and then I3 is determined by the fact that the sum of these three, the product of these three is the trivial ideal class. So a consequence of this is that the number of orbits of cubes having a given discriminant is always a square, <laughs> yeah, which is something that wouldn't be easy to see uh, without this, I think. Okay, so what I want to say, say next is that, okay, so just, so composition of cubes, you can compose cubes, you can compose binary quadratic forms, and I want to point out that the same composition law allows one also to compose not just binary quadratic forms, but binary cubic forms can now be composed. And the reason is that, well, you can impose symmetry. So if you look at just the space of uh, triply symmetric cubes, right, so if you hold a, if you hold a cube on the diagonal and you start rotating, right, then that, there's an order three symmetry there. So let's look at all cubes, two by two cubes, two by two by two cubes that stay fixed under that rotational symmetry of order three. Yeah? So it looks like that, right? So you have A and D as the diagonal. And now if you rotate along the diagonal through A and D, the B's go into the B's and the C's go into the C's. Right? So this is, a, this, is a, uh, this is a triply symmetric cube. And so what do triply symmetric cubes mean? Well, what do, what do symmetric squares mean? If you have a symmetric square matrix, you can think of that as a quadratic form. Right? So in the same way, if you have a triply symmetric cube, you can think of that as a cubic form. So if you have a triply symmetric cube like that, you can think of it as uh, right, it's, a symmetric, it's a totally symmetric trilinear form, so it's a, it's, you can think of it as a cubic form uh, or a symmetric trilinear form. 
So you can identify it with the cubic form ax cubed plus 3bx squared y plus 3cxy squared plus dy cubed. So, so triply symmetric cube you can think of uh, as a binary cubic form, except that there are these threes in the middle. In terms of representation theory, what's going on here, if you have a cube, which is z2 tensor z2 tensor z2, and you look at a totally symmetric version of that, that's sim3 of z2, right? So, so the symmetrization process takes space of cubes to space of binary cubic forms. And now we can specialize what we said for cubes. We know what cubes parameterize, and so what do triply symmetric cubes parameterize? Well, what did cubes, cubes parameterize? Cubes parameterized an order in a quad, uh, quadratic field together with three ideal classes uh, that multiply to the trivial class. If the cube is totally symmetric, that means those three ideal classes are all the same. Right? And they multiply to the identity. So what that means is that you're isolating a uh, three torsion element in the class group. Because right? you have three ideal classes that are all the same and they multiply to the identity. So, so this gives a solution to another orbit problem. Namely, if you take the space of binary cubic forms with threes in the middle here, that's kind of key, uh, modulo the action of SL2Z, then these orbits are in one-to-one -one correspondence with an order in a quadratic field together with an order three ideal class, a three torsion ideal class. So this method has extracted uh, a particular type of torsion in the class group of, of the quadratic field, or of the quadratic order. And this really is sort of what's, what's behind when Henri talked about the special cases of cohen leinster that were proven by davenport Hilbron for the three torsion and quadratic fields. This, this correspondence is really what's behind that. They don't write it that way, but that's sort of what's going on uh, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, okay. So maybe I'll just give one more quick example. Instead of imposing triple symmetry on the cube, one could have imposed double symmetry. So that just means that the front face and the back face are both symmetric matrices. And so what do such cubes correspond to? Well, the front face is a binary quadratic form and the back face is a binary quadratic form. So a doubly symmetric cube you can think of as a pair of binary quadratic forms. Right? The front face is a binary quadratic form and the back face is a binary quadratic form. Right? In terms of representation theory, right, if you have z2 tensor z2 tensor z2 and you just symmetrize the last two factors there, you'll get z2 tensor sim2 z2. So a cube, when you doubly symmetrize, you go to a pair of binary quadratic forms. And so what do, what do the orbits of SL2Z cross SL2Z do to this particular uh, prima genus vector space? Well, if you're just symmetrizing two of the factors, then you have three ideal classes. Two of them are now the same. Right? So if two of them are now the same, then the third one's determined. So really, the two that are same, those are the, that's the only one you need to keep around. And so the solution to this orbit problem is that if you take Z2 tensor sim2 Z2, mod modulo the action of SL2Z squared, that parameter, again parameterizes just ideal classes in orders in quadratic fields. So it's interesting. Pairs of binary quadratic forms parameterize the same thing as single binary quadratic forms. <laughs> so in particular, the number of orbits of discriminant D for pairs of binary quadratic forms is the same as the number of orbits of discriminant D for single binary quadratic forms. Okay, that's something that follows from this. Yeah, it doesn't, because you have three ideal classes, two of them are the same, and then the third is determined. Yeah. Oh, the factor two. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. They're different kinds of binary quadratic forms. That's right. They always have a two in the middle. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so what was the point of all this? So the point is, so these discussions illustrate that once you have a law of composition on the space of cubes, two by two by two cubes, then sort of any invariant and covariant spaces, you know, uh, constructions that you make using the space of cubes also inherits the law of composition. Gauss composition is, is just one of those, but you also have a law of composition on cubes, you have a law of composition on binary cubic forms, on pairs of binary quadratic forms, and actually many other spaces that I, uh, that I didn't talk about that just come once you understand cubes. Yeah. So the operation that I talked to, so you can start with the space of cubes and you can do various representation theoretic operations. For example, symmetrization. 
that's the operation I was just talking about, right? You take a cube and you can talk about its triply symmetric version, and that isolates a certain kind of torsion uh, in the class group. So symmetrization on the representation theory side, on the number theory side, it corresponds to equating the algebraic objects that were being parametrized. So for example, in the case of cubes, when you set all, when you took the triply symmetric cube, then it ended up setting those three ideal classes all equal, right? And that's how you figured out uh, what was being parametrized by the symmet symmetrized version. Uh, there's also an operation called skew symmetrization uh, that I'll say a little bit more about, and that corresponds to taking direct sum of the algebraic objects being parametrized. Uh, there's a symplectization that takes direct sum and adds a symplectic structure. There's Hermitianization, <laughs> which, uh, so for example, if you did a Hermitianization to a cube, it would take those, those three ideal classes would become conjugate over a cubic extension. And so you end up parametrizing uh, certain Galois conjugate sets. Uh, and then the most mysterious one uh, is what's what I call dualization. Uh, you can take the dual representation, and arithmetically what it always turns out to correspond to is a dualization under class field theory. Uh, so I should say these are just ways, these are not theorems, <laughs> these are just ways of guessing. If you start with a representation and you do some representation theoretic operation on it, like one of these, then it allows you to guess what will happen to the algebraic objects that were originally being parametrized by the object that you started with. And what's going to happen when you get the new representation, what's going to happen to those algebraic objects. So this allows one to guess what various representations parametrize. But of course, in each case, you then have to go and prove, uh, uh, prove it individually for each case. Uh, because when you do these operations on the number theoretic side, often it introduces new kinds of algebraic objects, and you need new techniques to deal with them. Uh, But the point is, once you, start, once you start with the space of cubes, you can start applying all these representation theoretic op operations. Uh, and you start guessing what, uh, what new things are going to be parametrized by those, by those new spaces. And by starting with the space of cubes and applying these operations, you can, you can actually get to most of the primogenous vector spaces, almost all of the primogenous vector spaces, just by starting with the space of cubes. So that list of primogenous vector spaces used to look like this random uh, looking list of representations, but in fact they're all connected via these kinds of operations. And so you can think of uh, the space of primogenous vector spaces as this web uh, that's in five dimensions, <laughs> and you move around by these various representations, and each time you discover what's being, uh, what's being parametrized. And that way you can build, build your way to really some of the really big representations that have 40 or 50 dimensions by working your way up through these, uh, through these representation theoretic operations. So I can't really show you this web since it's five-dimensional, but I thought I, uh, here's a two-dimensional slice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So all right, here's Gauss's law over here. Gauss composition is binary quadratic forms. Binary quadratic forms parametrize orders in quadratic fields and ideal classes. And here's the space of cubes that everything's emanating from on this page. And in fact, in the whole five-dimensional web, they all emanate from here. Uh, so this is sort of Z, Z2 tensor, Z2 tensor, Z2, I, I sort of think, this is the mother of all primogenous vector spaces. <laughs> and then you can start applying these operations, and you can get to, to Gauss's law, Gauss composition of binary quadratic forms. Uh, you can get to this triply symmetric cube case, which is binary cubic forms. They parametrize orders uh, in quadratic fields together with an order three ideal class. Right? Uh, here's the space of pairs of binary quadratic forms. Remember, it that's going to parametrize one ideal class and then two more ideal classes that are the same. And so basically, you only have to keep I2 around. Right? Uh, okay, so, those, these, so this is the symmetrizing direction. Right? So we start with the space of cubes. We can doubly symmetrize. We can triply symmetrize. And what happens on the algebraic side is that you set various these three ideal classes that were summing to zero are now set equal. Two of them are set equal. All three are set equal okay, when you go down that way. OK, what happens in skew symmetrization? That's kind of fun. So <laughs> you start with Z2 tensor Z2. Let's say we, uh, we skew symmetrize those two factors. So what happens when you take Z2 tensor Z2 and you skew symmetrize? Well, when you symmetrize, you got sim2 of Z2. When you skew symmetrize, you get wedge2 of Z4. <laughs> So there are two things that you're skew symmetrizing. So that's the two. 
And 2 plus 2 is 4. That's why you get a 4 there. So that's, that's that representation theoretic operation. There's a, it's a natural, uh, it's a natural rep operation on the representation theory side. And the group SL2 cross SL2 gets replaced with SL4. That's what happens. Okay, so that's what happens on the representation theory side. And what happens on the algebraic side, what happens is that I2 and I3 uh, get fused together and become a rank 2 module. So I2 and I3 were rank 1 modules. You take their direct sum, you get a rank 2 module. And so this space here, Z2 tensor wedge 2 Z4, parameterizes quadratic orders together with, with rank 2 modules. So there's a, there's a relation here, namely that the determinant of M times I should be trivial. So I is determined by M. So really, this space here is Z2 tensor wedge 2 Z4 is parameterizing rank 2 modules over orders in quadratic fields. So just like Gauss composition parameterizes rank 1 modules, uh, this space parameterizes rank 2 modules uh, for orders in quadratic fields. And if you fuse all three of these together, so you do a skew symmetrization of all three of these factors, then you get wedge 3 of Z6, 2 plus 2 plus 2, which is over here. And so that ends up parameterizing rank 3 modules over, uh, over orders in quadratic fields, because you fuse three things together. Uh, so anyway, you can do various combinations like this. What gets fun is when you, when you start fusing together rings with ideals. So, so Z2 tensor, Z2 tensor, Z2 can be thought of as Z tensor, Z2 tensor, Z2 tensor, Z2. And now you can start skew symmetrizing these kinds of factors. And if you do that, so if you fuse together these two, you'll get wedge 2 of Z3, tensor, Z2 tensor, Z2. Right? And what happens is I1 and I2 come, come along for the ride, but S and, S and I3 get fused together. So what happens when you take a quadratic order and take the direct sum with an ideal class? It turns out it has a natural quaternion algebra structure. <laughs> and so this space here parameterizes quaternion algebras together with two rank one-half modules in the sense uh, right, so the quaternion algebra has rank four over Z, and I1 and I2 both have rank two. And one is a left module and one is a right module. <laughs> Okay, so this parameterizes, basically this parameterizes split quaternion algebras over Z. Okay. Now if you also decide to fuse these two factors together, so this Z2 tensor Z2, uh, you'll get a wedge 2 Z4. And these two rank 1 half modules will glue together to become a regular rank 1 module. And so this space here, which is basically Z3 tensor wedge 2 Z4, that parameterizes rank 1 modules over quaternion algebras over Z. So this is sort of the quaternion algebra analog of Gauss composition. It parameterizes rank 1 modules uh, over quaternion algebras. Uh, okay, I'll mention one more thing. If you, if you fuse all four of these factors together, <laughs> so you get wedge 4, because they're four factors, uh, Z7, 1 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. So this is wedge 4 Z7. It turns out that's a primogeneous vector space 2. Uh, and what happens when you take a quadratic ring and take the direct sum with three ideal classes that multiply to the identity? It turns out that has the natural structure of an octonian algebra. And so this, this space here, wedge 4z7, which has dimension 35, its integer orbits parameterize octonian algebras over z. Uh, oh, um, so the injection, the space actually, there's a natural injection of this space into this one. That's right, yeah, yeah, it's a sub thing, that's right, it's a subspace. Right. So this is the triply symmetric cubes that are a subspace of this, these are doubly symmetric cubes that are a subspace of this. So all these arrows mean that they're natural maps from one object into the, into the next. So you can imagine if you started with this 35 dimensional space and said, what are the integer orbits on this thing? <laughs> that would have been pretty hard, <laughs> uh, just to analyze those integer orbits. But if you work your way starting here uh, and work your way up, then you sort of, uh, you can sort of end up sweeping out all sorts of primogeneous vector spaces, and you understand what objects are parameterized uh, by those. Uh, okay, so, so here's, here's my favorite operation, which is dualization. Suppose you start with these binary cubic forms here. Remember those binary cubic forms had threes in the middle, right? And those corresponded to uh, quadratic orders with order three ideal classes, right? Three torsion ideal classes. Suppose one takes the dual representation. If you take the dual representation of those binary cubic forms, over Z, the dual, in a natural sense, is the space of binary cubic forms without the threes. And what are those parameterized? Well, that was this Dillon-Fedeev correspondence. So if you take the dual, okay, so 
So that's what allows you to go from quadratic to cubic. So, okay, how, how should I explain this? So, if you have three torsion ideal classes in quadratic fields, those are naturally dual under class field theory to cubic fields. Are you familiar with this? Maybe I'll. All right, so if you have, so say you have the rational numbers and you take a, uh, a quadratic extension. Uh, if you're looking at three torsion ideal classes in here, the dual object to that under class field theory is ATEL, uh, is, I'm sorry, unramified degree three extensions. Right? So you get unramified. Right, if you're talking about three torsion ideal classes in here, right, then under class field theory, the index three things in there correspond to uh, unramified degree three extensions. And one checks? Galois. Yeah, Gala, right. So you, one checks that it, they're uh, right, unramified degree three cyclic ex extensions, and one checks that if you're in that situation, then you're automatically actually Galois over Q with Gala group S3, and so this cuts out a cubic extension. Right. And so somehow, and in class field theory, the dual object to, or to three torsion ideal classes in quadratic fields are cubic fields. And what this is saying is that something's true even on the level of orders here, is that if you take the objects dual under class field theory to S comma I, where I is order three, you take, get a, a dual object, namely, so you have this dual representation, and that's going to correspond to cubic rings as we already saw in the Dillon Fede of correspondence. And so this, this dualization allows you to go from this quadratic page to a cubic page. <laughs> and so here is a, a set of representations. Maybe I'll put this over here. Let's see. Okay, so there's this dual line that's going very far and coming over here. <laughs> okay. And that's the cubic page. Uh, and here we have cubic rings. And then we get various spaces that map to this space of binary cubic forms that parameterize objects that have to do with cubic rings and cubic fields. So in particular, just like Z2 tensor Z2 tensor Z2 space of cubes was sort of the master of this quadratic page, uh, Z2 tensor Z2 tensor Z2 gets replaced by Z2 tensor Z3 tensor Z3. And that, that's sort of the, the master of the cubic page. And everything comes from there. And this space parameterizes cubic rings together with two ideal classes that multiply to the trivial class. So the way, so the way, you can think of this as a pair of three by three matrices, right? Z2 tensor Z3 tensor Z3 is a pair of three by three matrices. And what do you do when you have a pair of three by three matrices, right? A and B, you multiply A by an indeterminant and B by an indeterminant, add them and take the determinant. And when you do that, you get a cubic form, a binary cubic form. And that's the cubic ring that corresponds to the binary cubic form. So that's how you get the cubic ring. But this extra information here corresponds to two extra ideal classes, uh, which I didn't tell you how to make, but you can make them. And this, in fact, is an exact parameterization. And so, of course, I1 and I2 multiply to the identity here. So basically, everything's determined by I1. So this space really just parameterizes cubic rings together with an ideal class. So this space here is the cubic analog of Gauss composition. Okay, it parameterizes ideal classes in orders in cubic fields. And then again, you can symmetrize to extract order two ideal classes in cubic fields. Uh, you can skew symmetrize to get rank two modules over orders in cubic fields. Uh, you can do something mysterious here, and I don't know what happens. Uh, and finally, you can, you can skew symmetrize all three of these together. So what happens when you take a, a cubic ring together with two ideal classes that multiply to the identity? and uh, you fuse them together, you take the direct sum. And that turns out to have a natural structure uh, of a rank 9 division algebra over Z. And you have to define what that means. But you get a rank 9 division algebra over Z when you take these three uh, objects together and you fuse them together. So it turns out, what's 3Z8? This is also a pre vector space, 56 dimensional. And it parameterizes rank 9 division algebras over Z. And again, if you just started with the space, it'd be really hard to understand what the integer orbits mean. But here, you figure out that the integer orbits it comes with a definition that the orbits correspond to certain rank 9 algebras over Z that have a certain structure, uh, division algebra-like structure. OK, now how do, we, how do we go to even higher number fields? I should mention, all these spaces that I'm talking about, they're pre homogeneous vector spaces. They also have an intimate connection with uh, the exceptional Lie algebras. So,
And if you're interested in knowing about that, I'm happy to talk about it uh, afterwards. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So uh, SL8 is acting on wedge 3Z8. SL3 cross SL5. Yeah, it's basically just a product of SLs. You look at the exponents of the Zs, and you <laughs> those, those are the SLs that are acting. Uh, so these, these representations, even on the quadratic page, they all come from the exceptional Lie groups in a very special way. Uh, uh, it's a bit mysterious, but I'm happy to tell you more about that uh, if you're interested. But again, you can do a dualization procedure here. So you always go to the bottom right corner, and you think, OK, what happens if you dualize this object? Okay, so this is order two ideal classes in cubic fields. If you make the analogous picture for order two ideal classes in cubic fields, uh, it turns out you get uh, quartic fields. Uh, you can make it if you want. So, so you start with, so say you start with a cubic field, and then you look at order two ideal classes in here, the dual object is unramified quadratic extensions. So it's unramified. And now if you take the Galois closure, it turns out that that's, if this was non-cyclic, then this will be an S4 extension. And so it cuts out a quartic field. And so the dual object to order two ideal classes in here are quartic fields under class field theory. And this is a ring, this is a realization of that on the level of rings. So what happens is you look at these pairs of symmetric three by three matrices, right? And if you dualize the representation, these matrices had twos, uh, had twos in the cross terms. The dual won't, won't have twos in the cross terms. And so you get this representation, which is pairs of conics, as, as Henri was talking about today. So pairs of uh, conics in the plane, they cut out four points. And on the level of the integers, the integer orbits on this representation turn out to parameterize basically quartic rings, uh, together with uh, some additional uh, information on, on the resolvent, the cubic resolvent ring. Uh, so that parameterizes quartic rings. And so that's the quartic page. <laughs> it's not very big. <laughs> Of course, these are slices. There are, there are other things that are going on, but I just want to mention there's a natural line that goes through um, that z tilde there and binary cubic forms, and then this space, and ends up at this, this space that corresponds to quintics. So this, this space, z4 tensor wedge 2z5, quadruples of alternating two forms and five variables, the integer orbits on this pre homogeneous vector space turn out to correspond to quintic rings, okay, orders, basically orders in quintic fields, together with some information about sextic resolvent ring. So these are exact correspondences of the orbits uh, with these algebraic objects. So these are sort of algebraic parameterizations by pre homogeneous vector spaces. And what we found is that by these representation theoretic operations, we could sweep out all pre homogeneous vector spaces. And they all parameterized, uh, except for the couple of question marks that I had. <laughs> they all uh, seem to parameterize, and probably those do too. I think some of these correspond to algebraic objects that I've never seen definitions of. <laughs> and so <laughs> I don't know what to call them. <laughs> and that question mark was one of them. Uh, so, but the, when you're doing these operations, it really tells you what the algebraic objects you are getting. And amazingly, they always, almost all of them had names previously. And it makes me believe that all these algebraic objects were, that were been defined, you sometimes wonder, oh, is that a natural algebraic object? I always wondered, octonians, is that a natural object, algebraic object? Well, it sort of comes out from these operations on pre vector spaces. And I always find it amazing when I just find an algebraic object that already has been named. Uh, and then a couple that haven't been named. So I think maybe those are new natural algebraic objects that should be studied. But I don't know what they mean. Uh, OK, so, so the situation is that there are all these pre homogeneous vector spaces. And we now basically understand what the integer orbits uh, on each of these pre homogeneous vector spaces parameterize. And they all amazingly parameterize very interesting arithmetic objects. Uh, unless you don't think Octonians are interesting arithmetic objects. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but they all parameterize some kind of uh, arithmetic objects, and some of them are, are, of, are of a lot of interest to, to uh, number theorists, and uh, some are of interest to fewer number theorists. <laughs> but these, really, these things really convinced me. For example, octonians I really got into because of this, this way of building from ideal classes and quadratic fields to octonians. It really gives an arithmetic interpretation to octonian algebras, for example. So pre homogeneous vector spaces are not a, a random list of representations, but they're, in fact, a web that are connected in a very natural way, arithmetically and representation theoretically. Um, OK, so, so I want to mention uh, just a few applications. And then I'll get 
uh, more into the arithmetic statistics kinds of applications tomorrow, uh, as well as other representations. I was just talking about prima genus today as background. Uh, so first of all, there are computational applications, as Henri already mentioned. So there are work of Shanks that use binary quadratic forms to do calculations with ideal classes and quadratic fields, and there's work of Bellabas uh, in doing uh, calculations with cubic fields using binary cubic forms. Uh, I think Anamora had started this implementation of the, of the Cordic case uh, and so on. So there's the, those are those applications. Once you, so once you have such parameterizations, like binary quadratics and binary cubics have had the best ways of computing with ideal classes and quadratic fields and cubic fields, we now have a, a whole host of representations, and those should give efficient ways of computing with all these algebraic objects. Uh, okay, the second application is to theory of primogenous vector spaces. Uh, so there's a whole theory of zeta functions of prima genus vector spaces due to Sato and Shintani, and developed by Daskovsky and Wright and Yuki, and now by Taniguchi and Thorne, uh, as we'll hear more about this week. Uh, so most of this works have been for binary cubic forms, because that was sort of the biggest prima genus vector space at the time that had this kind of arithmetic interpretation. But now we have lots of prima genus vector spaces whose orbits have interpretations, and so their zeta functions would be of interest to study uh, for that reason. Uh, there's also a connection with uh, modular forms on exceptional groups that was developed by Gann, Gross, and Savin. Uh, they showed that if you look at modular forms on G2, then Fourier coefficients for such modular forms are naturally indexed by binary cubic forms and thus by cubic rings. And now these later works by Lucianovich and Weissman and Volpato show that a lot of these other primogenous vectors, their orbits come up as naturally as the Fourier coefficients for modular forms on, on other exceptional groups. And now that we know what those orbits mean, uh, that allows you to study uh, those kinds of modular forms uh, from that perspective in terms of the Fourier expansions. Uh, there are also nice applications to non-commutative algebras because now we have all these parameterizations for various non-commutative algebras. And so one can study structures of non-commutative algebras by studying orbits of these representations. Uh, there's a nice work of Krutalevich uh, to understand uh, uh, some, some of the exceptional Jordan algebras through these representations. Uh, okay, so what I'll, talk, what I'll start talking about tomorrow a little bit is how one can use these kinds of parameterizations to understand sort of theorems in arithmetic statistics. How many such algebraic objects are there that have given invariants? Well, now that we have an explicit parameterization of a lot of these arithmetic objects, for example, orders in quartic fields, we can try to ask questions like how many how many orders in quartic fields are there that have bounded discriminant or that have certain other invariant properties or if you count them in different ways, what happens? Uh, these can start to be addressed once you have these parameterizations. And so I'll talk more about that tomorrow. And the other thing I'll start talking about is non primogenous representations. And those are where you start having connections with, uh, uh, with, with arithmetic objects that have more than one invariant, for example, algebraic curves and, and Jacobians of algebraic curves and uh, and other such uh, objects that have moduli. So, okay, so I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>